Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the latest episode of The Seditionists. I'm Keith Reeves, and I'm here with my colleague and friend, Rob Furman. And today we're going to do a little bit of discussing uh, communication, um, something that has come to my attention time and time again as of late. Um, is a lack of transparent and consistent communication that seems to revolve around an unwillingness to say, I don't know. I don't know when it became important to people to have all the answers. I think that it was probably this big when I figured out that I don't have all the answers. I certainly kept that to myself, as anybody who knew me as a teenager will tell you. Um, I liked to pretend that I had all the answers, but I think I knew that I didn't. And the older I get, the less interested I am in being seen as a person who has all the answers. I'm much more interested in asking good questions. But when it comes to implications, not only for our classroom practices, but also for our administrative practices, why are we so obsessed with everyone having the right answer, sometimes even before they know what the question is. Communication to me doesn't seem to be the sort of thing that involves mind reading. But for some reason that seems to have pervaded much of our school culture. Does that have a sociological basis? Does it have a political basis? Is it just a matter of personal psychology? But let's dig through a little bit and try to figure out why it is that so many of us in public education consistently complain about bad communication. Rob, do you see this a lot in your work? Uh, yeah, it's interesting that you that you talked about the idea of everybody needing to know the right answer. Um, and I think that we get a lot of that, especially in education. And I think to some degree that's put upon us um, somewhat from ourselves and a lot from our community because we're the ones teaching the children. Mm -hmm. So we should have all the answers, like even with even with uh, our students, you know, the students are, are very surprised whenever we don't have the correct answer or, or we need to find the answer. We just don't have it instantly at our in our tips, fingertips. Um, but I think back, you know, if you look at a store, historically speaking, there wasn't really a whole lot to have to know mm -hmm. where nowadays it's almost impossible for one person to have all the answers to, to, to any subject and, and and I think that there's a there's a, a bad blend there because as our leaders because you know they go from teachers to principals to superintendents and so on they still feel like they have, they have to have all the answers all the responses properly and and, and it's I think it, we've sort of created a teaching leadership now that can't ask for help can't ask another colleague, because it makes them look like they're inferior because they don't know, which obviously is completely ludicrous, but yeah. it just feels like the, the, the higher up you go, the less they want to ask for help. Like, like I think a teacher's more apt to ask for help than maybe a principal, than maybe a superintendent, than maybe you know, moving on and on. It seems like the higher you go, the more they internalize that they have to have the answer, that they can't get an answer from somebody else, which I don't know if it's for egotistical reasons, or maybe it's just that persona of, I can't ask, but it's certainly beca it's becoming quite a problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm running into things like that left and right. Um, and it, I, I realize that it, one of the reasons is because I I'm at a quote unquote higher elevation. I worry sometimes about using the word higher because I, I think anybody who knows me for my actual work, think I don't think that I'm like higher than a teacher. To the contrary, I just have more people right. to serve. Um, but now when you get up to that like, you know, 15, 20,000 foot view and you're looking at things from a little more broadly of a policy perspective, I find that, that I run into that all the time. You know, basic proactive phone calls to say, hey, do you have this piece of equipment? Or, hey, do you have this situation at your school? Or, hey, how have you done things in the past? Could have headed off these massive problems that explode because someone who didn't have the answer made an assumption or thought they knew and then gave that advice or that information to a group of people or put it in a document and then decisions were made and decisions were made after that were made after that. And so you end up with these massive systems or policies or decision makings or initiatives as we love to call things nowadays that were all rooted in a fundamental mistruth or misperception. A little bit of communication, a little bit of question asking and a whole lot of, I don't know, but I'll find out for you. Or I don't know, why don't we call the right person? Would have headed off all of that at the pass. It's just totally infuriating to me. And I, I suppose that there is the case to be made, as you indicated, that probably some of it comes from us because we are looked at as academics in education as supposed as we're supposed to know things. 
And, and I mean, I certainly, I know bunches of things, <laughs> uh, some of which are relevant, some of which are not. But as an educational technologist, I've always perceived my role to be pedagogical in nature. That's what the job is. That's what the Virginia Handbook says it's supposed to be. So when I had an interesting interaction with a math teacher, I think two years ago now, the math teacher, I, I said, well, I don't know the exact application for this in a math context because you're asking me a content question, not a, a pedagogical or, or a technology question, and I don't know math well enough. And the woman reacted with like shock and, and, and glee, saying like, finally, an educational technologist admits they don't know everything. I'm like, is that the perception you've had of people in my field that we think we know every content area? I'm forever saying, I was like, sweetie, I'm a music teacher. Mm -mm, I don't know math. <laughs> you know, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And I'm working on knowing, yeah, not knowing the things I don't know. But <laughs> we, we need to stop pretending like everybody knows everything all the time. I've got a great point for you, but I want to I want to phrase it as a question. Okay? I want you to take it and run with it. All right. Do you feel that there's a possibility that those people in power no longer look at the need for expert advice because we have got a national leadership that don't doesn't don't li, does not listen. How do you say that? A national leadership that takes experts' advice and just flat out ignores it. For example, <laughs> for example global warming. You know, we have scientists, experts that are saying, you know, they ask the question, "Is it happening?" The scientists turn around and say, "Yes," and then they go, mm, "I don't like that answer. I, I, I disagree with you. I'm not going to ask anymore." Do you think that has anything to do with this, Keith? <laughs> yup. <laughs> uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan said, everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but they're not entitled to their own facts. But that has gone right out the window, hasn't it? I can't help but think of the, I think it was a senator. It might have been a, a representative. The guy who stood on the floor of the of the Congress and had the snowball and was like, see, no global warming. I'm like, what? Oh, that's that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. <laughs> so now that you mention it, I can't help but wonder if the, you know, when you become a leader or you want to be perceived as a leader, if you're not supposed to just know everything and including knowing better than the experts, that has to be a part of it. We have all the research in the world that says that we should stop grading homework. We have all the research in the world that says we should be doing year round schooling. We have all the research in the world that says tracking and homogenous groups is a bad idea. We have all the, we should lower class sizes and we need to have better funding models and that we need to use better education technology. We need to change our teacher preparation programs. We need to stop using standardized testing. We need to stop giving money to corporations that gives us bullcrap data. So we make bullcrap to say, we're not paying attention to any of that, are we? So yeah, maybe my lamenting somebody not picking up the phone from another school or a central office location and asking me is really a symptom of a larger professional social problem of people not caring about who really is supposed to know things and who isn't. I, I hadn't thought of that, but that's scary to think about. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting because uh, I, I sort of have that feeling at times where it's like people don't want to go to the experts anymore because either they think they're expert enough or they should be an expert enough, or there might even be a little bit of mistrust. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, our world is full of people feeling that way at the moment. So maybe it's a little bit of mistrust where even if I do give you the answer, I don't, I don't trust your, your facts, your yeah. opinion. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it is definitely uh, a problem. And, and ironically enough, when we talk about 21st century skills, the ability to communicate is probably at the top of the list of, of, of importance. But yet it seems like the, the adult generation right now sort of does it kind of poorly. Um, so, so, so we're not being a real good model for our students in terms of how to communicate, how to work together. Um, leadership being another one of those 21st century skills, one of the biggest things of being a leader is to have your community and have all your people in your organization communicating with one another and communicating with you. So uh, sort of the way we communicate now is counterproductive to every leadership model we've ever discussed also. Yeah. Uh, you know, 
uh, so many people I talk to about this very issue, when we identify a circumstance in which communication broke down, people didn't do what they should have done, they weren't modeling good behavior for kids, and they certainly weren't monitoring it for the people that they supervise, and they say, well, this was a communications breakdown. When you have a culture with systemic communications breakdowns, you got to figure out why that is and do something about it. And I do think that one of the motivators that I run into frequently is people don't want to be blamed. Every, and I'm wondering, because you, you got me thinking about larger sociological implications. We, we're a very blame-oriented culture right now, aren't we? You know, the Republicans will tell you that it's the Democrats to blame, and the Democrats will tell you that it's the Republicans to blame. Those of us who have neither party say, don't blame me. But, you know, there are so many instances when people are looking for someone they can point at, someone they can scapegoat, which is terribly unhealthy behavior, to say, well, that person is to blame for your lot in life, or that situation is to blame. And I know that I get very troubled when I get thrown under the bus personally for the breakdown of a system. Now, even if I'm responsible for administering that system, there's a depersonalization that makes me want to help. If you say, well, this system isn't working for me, or this method broke down, or there was a communications problem, depersonalizing it and talking about the actual problem helps bring me into the conversation. But I, I think one of the reasons I'm so frustrated right now is I get a lot of, I see a lot of finger pointing among colleagues. You know, my school district that I work for, for example, is in the midst of a massive transition from a model that's largely teacher-centered, homogenized, and desktop computer-based to very mobile, personalized, and student-centered. It's a, it's a massive sea change, so the anxiety level is very high. And a lot of people want to say, well, it's that person's fault, or it's that person's responsibility, or this is... The, Everybody take a breath. I, I got yelled at the other day because I keep doing, making this gesture. I'm like, everybody needs to just settle down, chill out, and figure out what are the real problems. And perhaps one of the overarching things we could talk about to make that better is depersonalizing the situation and then helping to promote a wider culture of trusting experts and giving them the benefit of the doubt. My current principal uses a phrase all the time that I was a little troubled by at first. He says, presume goodwill. And I get really frustrated because I'm like, but that guy's a jerk. You know, that guy's always been a jerk. He's always a jerk to me. And then I stop and I realize I'm not practicing when I preach, right? I'm personalizing a problem and I ought to presume that he's coming at it from a good, a, a perspective of goodwill. Maybe it is a cultural problem, not just a systemic problem. It's an interesting point. Thank you. Um, and, and, you know, one thing, just to go back to what the a comment you made, the uh, when I was doing my dissertation, I was doing it with low socioeconomic parents and mm -hmm. trying to give them some positive self-efficacy to work with their kids. And um, one of the one of the facts I found, which I think is true for parents as well as as teachers, is you know, at the end of the day, we're all trying to make good decisions to help children innately. Mm -hmm. We want to do that. We may not always achieve doing that, but ultimately we want to do that. And I think parents are the same way, and I think we're the same way as teachers and leaders, that ultimately we're trying to do right. I don't think anybody's out there to, to intentionally screw the pooch, for lack of a better term. <laughs> uh, but, but you know, there are certainly mistakes along the way. Yeah. So, so I really liked what you said about everybody just needs to stop playing the blame game. You know, mistakes are going to happen. That's human nature. And in education, we know we have to have a thick skin and that's okay. We, we can have a thick skin. Somebody can blame us, but, but for us to pass it along and not just stop it where it is and say, okay, fine. You want to blame me? Go ahead. Let's fix the problem. Now that's, I think where, where we need to probably step up our game a little bit. Keith, why don't you wrap this up for us? That makes sense. And that gives me something to think about as I go back into, you know, I'm in summer school right now and I'm working with a lot of people I don't know very well. Um, I'm trying to be, you know, kind of open door, open mind, open heart. Uh, but I think that I've got more to think about than I did before about, um, you know, being reflective in the way that people communicate and that if frustration is being expressed towards me personally, you know, maybe I can do a better job of saying, okay, they don't really mean that it's not about me as a person, but what is the real problem? And then maybe I can help model the very positive pro-social communication that you mentioned. It's an interesting idea. And see, we even learn things ourselves from each other here on The Seditionist. Uh, thanks, everybody, very much. I'm Keith Reeves. This is Rob Furman for The Seditionist. We'll see you next time.